Turn in the book of Revelation, if you would, chapter one. I'm gonna read a little bit of scripture here uh, and let the Lord have his way. You know, when you think of the book of Revelation, you think of Bible prophecy, people are kind of sometimes get nervous. I'm glad you're in a church where prophecy is flowing. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit. And the pastor's been even preaching and teaching on prophecy, which is wonderful. And I'm telling you, your church is, grow. your church is growing and gonna continue to grow. Let's read, if we could, a few verses from chapter one. The Bible said, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and he signified it by his angel unto the servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you, peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the king of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And even so, amen. And Jesus speaks and says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Can you say amen? Give the Lord some praise. You may be seated. Hallelujah. So this is the opening words of the book of Revelation. Instantly, John is in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was sent out to be put to, actually, they tried to kill him. They boiled him in oil. They lowered him into oil, pulled him back up, and he was still there shouting in the name of Jesus. Can you see that one? They said, we better not try to kill him anymore. We better just put him on an island out there off the coast of Greece, the little island called Patmos, where at the age of around 94, he began to go into the spirit of the Lord, and as the power of God came on him, he began to get this absolute glorious revelation of the last days that would be used to feed the church, to encourage the church, to enlighten the church. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but if you get the word of God in your life, you're not going to be dead, you're not going to be walking around blinded, but you'll have the eye salve of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and you'll be able to live victoriously. In the last days, can you say amen? For the Lord hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but of power and love, or love and power and a sound mind, amen? Because love is powerful, praise the Lord. All right, let's start at the beginning, and let's just take a little stroll back, if you will, into the book of Isaiah, the 14th chapter, because the prophet Isaiah began to understand that there would be an ultimate confrontation in the last days. Now, we're constantly battling principalities and powers. Matter of fact, Paul said, for I wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We come against the forces of darkness, the prince of the power of the air. We understand who our enemy is, but does he understand who we are in Christ? I think too many times the devil gets glorified running around with his third of a backslidden angels and we seem to give him more authority and power than what he deserves. He's a fallen angel with a third of the backslidden angels from heaven and there's two thirds of the angels with us. And we've been washed in the blood and you've got the power of the Holy Ghost in you. You've been baptized in the fire and of the Holy Ghost of God. And so there's something inside you that makes you a giant killer. And if you're willing to stand in the midst of the, of the confrontation that Satan brings, I want you to remind him on a daily basis. My mama gets up every morning, and my dad used to get a little aggravated with her. She gets up every morning out of bed, and praise God, 
Hallelujah. It's going to be a great day in the Lord. He goes, what are you doing dancing this morning? She goes, you'd dance too if you had what I had. Glory. Well, he's like, I got what you got. She said, then get up and dance. Come on, somebody. He said, I will after my second cup of coffee. You see, what happens is what we have done is we've allowed the devil. We've, we pull the cover over our head. We say, there's no need of me getting up in the morning and dealing with the confrontation today. I dread Monday morning. No, you ought to get up and say, glory to God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad therein. I'm ready. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. All right, let's read. But Isaiah begins to get a prophecy here, and he begins to speak prophetically, literally right at Lucifer. And here's what it says in Isaiah 14, verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It raised up from their thrones all the kings of nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, and the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. A lot of eyes in there. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, and they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, and that opened not the house of his prisoner? Folks, I can tell you, Satan wants to exalt himself. He is trying to climb above God. He wants to have the supremacy over God's creation. He has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He is the thief, Jesus said. But Christ said, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. You do not have fear in your life. There's not enough room in your heart for fear and faith. You've got to let the faith of God rise up in you in the midst of the confrontation, in the midst of the temptation, in the midst of of the depression. The Bible says, cast off, get rid of that spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. Can somebody say amen? amen. My beautiful wife's here today. I wish you'd stand after 37 years of marriage. So, okay, I used to have a fear of getting bit by a dog. Anybody else ever had that? Because I don't want to ask anybody to confess that. It's a bad confession. But I used to just, ugh. You know, and, uh, so I had an issue, okay? Lots of boxes of tissue when you have that. So one day I walk outside in the yard and I'm strolling around, not really watching what I'm doing. And I look and there's a, a stray pit bull and it's got its teeth. <laughs> and I went to speaking in tongues and everything else. And all of a sudden, I was frozen in just absolute fear and panic. And all of a sudden, the door swung open. And this woman came out with high heels. And she sprang into the yard. And she said, I dare you in the name of Jesus. Get out of here. And it was my wife, Heidi. And she, she stood and pointed and yelled, and then she moved toward it. And here's this pit bull, stray dog, been trained, warrior, ugly, deep, oh. And when she commanded, and then she, when she used the name of Jesus, hallelujah, that dog's tail tucked between its legs, it turned around and whimpered as it ran. And I said, oh, honey, thank you. She says, don't oh, honey, me. It's time for you to start taking authority over the situations you're afraid in your life. Don't be honey, me. Stay out in this yard till you get it right. Then she went back in, shut the door. Hello. I might have been in the doghouse, but at least it wasn't with the pit bull. Come on, somebody. We got a, the devil's a liar, isn't he? 
praise God, amen. All right, so here, here's what's happening. Isaiah's de- defining an enemy upon humanity. He's defining who is really behind the schemes of the new world order. He's defining who is going to actually raise up that beast kingdom we talked about yesterday. He's the one that is orchestrating uh, his last final plan to try to cause humanity. He really wants humanity to bow to him. He's just as exactly the spirit that was on Nebuchadnezzar when he built that idol, when he made that huge image and said to all the providences of Babylon that everyone, when you hear the music, is going to have to bow. What he's doing is he's trying to bring the body of Christ. He's trying to bring every human being to surrender their will to his supremacy, he believes, and he wants to show God that he can cause God's creation to reject him and his only begotten son. And so this plan, this ultimate plan that is bringing about this beast kingdom started a long, long, long time ago. And so when Nebuchadnezzar built this, of course, the three Hebrew boys, everyone was told that when they heard the music, everybody's got to bow. And so the three Hebrew boys, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow to the king's image. When the word spread that there were three that refused, and these guys weren't just anybody. These were guys that were already being promoted to be the head of certain providences. So listen, these guys stood strong in their faith. They brought them. You know what the king said? Anybody that doesn't bow will be thrown into this fiery furnace, into this idle belly of this beast that he had had a furnace made where they did pagan worship all the time. And the people feared this. They had seen people thrown in this. They had heard the agony. They knew the horrific death this would be. And so he brought fear. A kingdom of fear is what the devil is trying to bring. Oppression. Look at the people of Venezuela, one of the greatest nations we ever seen. It was the most prosperous country in all of South America. It was a democracy, a republic, where the people had the opportunity to be entrepreneurs and to have own businesses and to worship God freely. It was a great country till Hugo Chavez rose up and became their leader. He started changing their constitution. And within five years, removed every gun away from every citizen, telling them they could not responsibly take care of themselves. After he disarmed them, then they continued their uh, 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 doctrine, if you will, to change that constitution. After a while, he began to take businesses away from people selectively, taking farms away, taking factories away, having people assassinated quietly. As these things were developing, there became this fear that began to become a spirit of fear, a spirit of captivity began to flow throughout the land. And after Chavez died, the next president, of course, did similar things. Now, that's not the first time we've heard of this. This happened in Nazi Germany with Adolf Hitler. He did the exact same thing to them. We've seen Mussolini in Italy do the exact same thing to them. In other words, world leaders from every continent at some time or another have done similar things to people. And so this is a broad issue. This is a spiritual issue. It's, 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 it's happens constantly. And if you study history, you'll see that this oppressive spirit from Alexander the Great to Napoleon Bonaparte to the others of Charlemagne to others who took and captured people and conquered kingdoms. Satan has been working on this ultimate plan of a one world beast kingdom since the beginning and the dawning of time. He made Eve, he deceived Eve in the garden and he thinks he can continue to deceive humanity. So God said, you know what? I'm ready for this confrontation. If you really think you can defeat those that truly love me, if you think you can destroy my my creation, I'm willing to take the challenge with you and show you that there will be a remnant who will refuse to bow the knee to Baal. And when the day comes to the end, it'll be you who will be bowing at the feet of Jesus Christ. It's the battle of the cosmos. It's the ultimate situation developing. And so turn your Bibles, if you will, into the book of Daniel for a moment, chapter 8. 
The Bible talks about this kingdom starts to rise. Okay, I get it. And I realize it's there. We're not afraid of it. I'm in the kingdom of God. You can't get me out of the kingdom of God. No, you can't. Oh, y'all begging. No, you can't. How are you going to get through the blood? And then what are you going to do with the Holy Ghost? How are you going to stop the grace of God? When people try, when the devil thinks it, listen, some of you come here today. There's some things the devil's trying to turn you around. He's trying to mess you up. He's trying to overpower you. He's trying to bring giants in your life. He's trying to do things to you. He's trying to turn you away. He's trying to mess with your head. He's trying to break up your family. He's trying to wreck your economy. He's trying to ruin your business. He's trying to ruin your career. Look, that's all he does is go around and bring fear and destruction and murder and hate. But you do not have to succumb to that. You can get up every morning with giving God all the praise. Listen, he inhabits the praise of his people. And when you continue to worship him and you continue to walk with him, when you continue to live for him, he continues to give you the power to overcome the enemy. Amen. Behold, I give you power to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. Nevertheless, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your name is written down in glory. Amen. <laughs> Ooh, praise the Lord. It's all right. Here's what happens in Daniel chapter eight. Daniel's getting a vision from the Lord. He begins to talk about a kingdom and even an antichrist leader. And here's what he says in Daniel 8, 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, so he's speaking about the end times, when the transgressors are come to full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences uh, uh, shall stand up. So a king who has a fierce countenance and understands dark sentences shall stand up or take authority, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, for he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and uh, shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policies also, he shall cause craft to prosper, witchcraft in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many. So he promises peace, but it brings sudden destruction. He shall also stand up against the prince of princesses, Jesus Christ. But he shall be broken without hand, praise God. And so Daniel receives this vision of the Lord, again, of a leader. He also talks about this little horn rising up among the ten kings. You can read that in the book of Daniel chapter 7. It's also in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation 17. These 10 kings will be given crowns and they'll be made kings with one hour with the beast. So as the beast kingdom is trying to form, as the beast kingdom is trying to uh, gather its forces, its ultimate goal is to bring humanity under captivity. But I'm glad there's some prayer warriors still on this earth. And you have so much power, it's unbelievable. Matter of fact, I mean, they're afraid. The devil's afraid of you. He really is. I mean, you know what? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because if you, that prayer, did you guys see that building that was destroyed by a tornado this past, about a month ago? I don't know if it was in Oklahoma or, or it was in Alabama. Alabama. Destroyed the whole house, but the prayer room, grandma's prayer room is the only thing left, the war room. It is one of the greatest pictures I've ever seen in my life. It, it, the whole house is gone, but in the corner of one corner of the home was the war room, and all the walls were still there, and her prayers were still on the wall. The roof's gone, the whole house is gone, the kitchen sink's gone, the dryer's a mile away, but the prayer room is still standing there. Houses burn down all the time, and the only thing left a lot of times is the Bible. How many times have you seen that one? Crosses sometimes, churches burn, the only thing left is a cross or the Bibles. One church just burned down about six weeks ago. Everything in the church, it was a 150-year-old church, everything in the church destroyed except the Bibles that were in the back of the pews. Every Bible was okay. The Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word abideth forever. You can stand on it. This doesn't even make sense. Scientists are sitting there staring at the pages saying, why don't they burn? Why don't they burn? I give away Bibles all the time. We know if anybody ever comes to our website, anybody asks for a Bible, we send it to them for free. Personally send it to their home. 
in the last nine years, we've given away 20,000 Bibles individually to people all over the world for free. That is impossible. If you would have said that to me, that was, I said, you're crazy. How, how am I going to do that? But people have contributed. People stand with it. They know it's, God told me, he said, be sure you start sending people Bibles because right now you can get the Bible on the internet. Right now you can. Right now you can still watch my YouTube videos on, a, on the internet. Right now you can. But what happens when they pull the plug? People will be looking for a Bible and this will be the most precious thing in the world. They, the Bible says that they will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. The Bible says there'll be a famine in the land, not for bread and water, but for hearing the word of the Lord. There's an hour coming when the, already there's countries all over the world. I've been to India. We just held a crusade in India. I preached in India last May. 2,000 people. Look, and I, look I said, look, I'm going to go to preach in India. I went to the poorest country in the world, went to the poorest state in the poorest country in the world, and I went to the poorest uh, district in the poorest state in the poorest country in the world. And it was up in this little, up in the jungle. So I, this preacher says to me, Pastor, uh, and we got two orphanages there we take care of. We pay the rent on their buildings every month. And others help us. But this, uh, he says, yeah, if you'll come, let's hold a, let's hold a crusade. Let's hold a two-day crusade. I said, okay, you need a big tent. So we, we rented a tent. And I said, Dan, I want four buses. And there's four towns about 45 minutes away. I want to send a bus into each town and pick up people and bring them to it. Let's feed all of them that come. Make a big goat stew. Make a huge pot, as the president would say, huge pot. And uh, let's feed the people. Well, when I, I got the tent rented, but when I, went to buy, when I went to rent the buses, none of the bus drivers would drive for me because they were Hindu and they didn't want me to come and preach in the jungle. So guess what? I hired dump truck drivers. And they said, we'll take a deal. Yeah, we, we, we'll haul them in. So four dump trucks, you can watch the videos of it. We sent them in. We first sent in these preachers. We got 42 of these little uh, village preachers, uh, evangelists, and they're on their bicycles and motor scooters. And we sent them into those four towns, and they sent out pamphlets saying a crusade's coming. Preacher's coming from America. You can be saved. You can be healed of all diseases. You know, the, so they passed that around. And we told them the time that the dump truck was coming and the place to meet. The dump trucks rode into those towns. 250 people packed each dump truck. You won't believe this. When they come pulling in, I said, that's insane. I, no, I actually said, are you serious? People, it was 106 degrees, Pastor. Uh, 250 people packed in the back of a dump truck and they jumped out coming to hear the word of God. And guess what the driver said to us? We got to go back. We couldn't get them all. So we had to send all four back, and they came back again with 250 each again. Over 2,000 people came into the, into the jungle. Are you, that was one time we really had the rumble in the jungle. Can somebody say amen? And so we preached the gospel of Jesus Christ using 11 interpreters because they were from different villages and people spoke different languages. And we preached the gospel of Christ and how that there's all kinds, there's a million gods in India. But I told him, I said, if you're tired of all these gods for all these different things, why don't you come and try the true and living God? Come and get the one that can do it all. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of God. Woo, praise God. I'm used to jumping off pulpits. That one's a little high. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, somebody. Devil's getting nervous. People are, and when it came time for the altar call, hundreds of them came forward, praying and repenting and accepting Christ their Savior. Over a thousand came for healing. It took four hours to pray for them all. But praise God, God sent revival. It's still going on in the jungles of India. Local churches spun off from it. Preachers are being called to preach. So don't tell me these last days, the greatest revival in history is about to hit the world. Oh, hallelujah. I feel a revival in here. I think the pastor might have said that when he got up here. You can feel the Holy Ghost. 
the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the fire of God that breaks the chains of sin, that breaks the shackles that bind people's souls, that breaks every demon in hell, that gives authority to the believer. It's in him that we live and move and have our very being. If God be for us, who can be against us? Give somebody a high five. Give somebody a high five. Praise God. Praise God. Wow, it's March Madness. The devil's getting nervous. Oh, Pastor, you can see it now. Resurrection Sunday is coming. Something's going to happen in this church like you've never seen before on that day. I don't know how many they think they're baptizing, but you can take it times two because something's going to happen that day. God's moving mightily. Listen, when, oh, hallelujah, when, when, when Christ died, when he died on the cross, when he hung between the heavens and the earth, and Satan was trying to get him to come off that cross, when he tried to get him to, to forget the plan, when Jesus was praying in the garden, and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You, and his sweat became as great drops of blood, but he settled it that day. He settled it in the garden that he was going to take it to the cross and he was going to break the chains of sin and set humanity free from the bondage and the darkness and the despair and give life to the lifeless, hope to the hopeless, joy to the joyless, and to give victory to you that have been living in defeat. It's in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh, there ain't no grave. Oh, ain't no grave. <laughs> Gonna hold this body down. Oh, yeah. My grandma's coming out of the ground. She went dancing in. She'll come dancing out. <laughs> Woo, glory. I gotta get back to the sermon. What am I doing? I am preaching the sermon. Oh, my Lord, where am I supposed to go? Oh, <laughs> Oh, the Antichrist. Oh, how about Jesus Christ? <laughs> the son of perdition. That's what they called Lucifer. That's what they called Judas. He betrayed Christ, didn't he? He was called the son of perdition. And there's no one else in the Bible ever called the son of perdition except the Antichrist that rises in the last day. But I got news for him. Christ may have sweated and prayed and, and, and conquered it and he took that cross and he drug it through the cobblestone streets of the city but when he got to Golgotha's mountain he laid down his life for humanity. They drove the Roman spikes into his hands and his feet but Christ was continuing to intercession for the people. My Lord have mercy. It's the grace of God being on display at Calvary. He hung there, he hung there, and one of those, one of the thieves who was guilty, we're all guilty, we've all sinned and come show the glory of God, but he said, if you be the son of God, come off this cross and deliver yourself and us, but he was trying to deliver him, he just didn't realize it. The other man turned and said, Lord, Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. <laughs> I believe, in other words. I believe. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus looked at him and said, My son, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, just about a week ago, we uh, had the funeral for Heidi's mother. And uh, it was a tough, very tough thing. But you know, there was a part of me that, as I stood there, I said, you know, there's a day coming. We're gonna be reunited in glory. We're gonna be reunited. So Christ dies. The Bible said, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he gave up the ghost. He said, it is finished. And he dies. They came knowing that it was the, almost on the beginning of the feast of Passover. And the Sabbath about to begin, 
and it could not leave them on the tree, so they break the legs of those that were there to kill them, but when they come to Christ, he's already gone. So they pierce him in the side. Out comes the water and the blood. Out comes the bride being birthed. You know, when, Moses, when Adam was put in a deep sleep, God took the side of the Adam and brought out a woman, gave him a bride. When Christ died on the cross, the Lord birthed the bride. You are part of the bride. Christ died. They took him down off the cross. They put him in the tomb. They rolled the stone in front of it, and Satan, for just a few short hours, had the Son of God in a place he thought would be the confinement of his own dark abyss of, of damnation. But that's not what happened. Jesus come to wreck the plans of the devil, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I could see him when he came in. I could see him when he came in. When the hell's gates started shaking and the demons started quaking and my mind started aching. Somebody's back is breaking. And all of a sudden, the gates of hell swung open and the son of the living God jumped into hell's demon domain and snatched the keys of hell and death. And said, I don't know what you all think this is, but I'm going to hold a three-day revival while I'm here. And he preached. And he, and he set the captives free. And when he came out of that tomb, he did the same thing for the rest of humanity. we we'll call upon his name. So what happens, Paul? What's going to happen in this era we're living in? There's going to be strange things. Jesus said in the last days, you'll see signs in the heavens. There'll be blood and fire, pillars of smoke, it says in Joel 2. Jesus said there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, the stress of nations with perplexity. The sea, the waves will be roaring. Men's hearts will fail them for fear, for looking after things that are coming upon the earth, for the power of heaven will be shaken. We have, we, we're breaking records on earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, asteroids and meteorites racing by the earth. Radiation levels up 18% on this planet the last three years. You don't even hear anything about this on the uh, lamestream media. There's, uh, there's turmoil. There's, 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 there's tension. There's an anxiety. People are depressed. Satan is releasing every demon. I even wrote a book called Zombie Apocalypse because I did it because you had all these people literally being possessed with demons and eating on people and biting people. And just, and, and just doing things, and so they all, and I have, I have a, in my book I wrote it, there's 35 actual accounts where people actually were possessed with what I believe is the, uh, the type of legion demon. They would strip down naked, had superhuman strength, would bite people or eat people's face off or eat their intestines or, and they carry Bibles and quote scripture or say they're the Messiah. This is demon spirits. These are demonic forces being released on the earth. Hollywood glamorizes the zombie apocalypse. They're, for 12 years now, it's still the hottest craze in Hollywood. But really what the devil's doing is glorifying the resurrection of the damned. The Bible says there's two resurrections. Blessed are you have part in the first resurrection for the second death has no power over you. When the saints of God raised from the grave, they're going to have a glorified body like and under Christ. They're going to come out with the glory of God shouting as they rise in the air. And the Bible even says, and there's us that are alive remain and be caught forever to be with the Lord. And so shall we be with the Lord. But then there is a second resurrection. The Bible says that the hour is coming when all them that are in the grave are going to hear his voice. Some are going to come forth with the resurrection of life and others the resurrection of damnation. So what, do you really want to be here when the second resurrection happens? When the dead in sin come out of the grave with corruptible bodies, not incorruptible. So there will be a zombie apocalypse. There really will be one, but it is not one you ever want to be here to see or be a part of. There will be. The dead in sin will rise to face the judgment of God. Nothing pretty about that at all. Yet that's exactly what Hollywood is doing. Glorifying the demons of hell. Lucifer's master plan at work. 
And so uh, the Lord led me to write a book about it and to show people what's going on and to help them understand that they want to believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That they can have the victory daily. Matter of fact, when you get saved, you get washed in the blood, you get born again, you get baptized in water. That, that means you're getting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You go down an old man, you come out anew, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here's what's going on. The final confrontation. What about it? How does it, how does it end, Pastor? Well, let's go to Revelation real quick here. We'll just jump over one moment here. Just a second. I'm going to hurry. Here's what it says in Revelation 19. I love this chapter. The Bible says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord of our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down. They worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, I, did, you, did it just say the wife? has made herself ready. That's you. It's wedding day's coming. <laughs> wedding day's coming. We're getting ready. Hallelujah, we're getting ready. My Lord, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now listen to this. And I fell at his feet to worship him. He said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren. And we have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It is important. The prophetic word of God is necessary. Because if we don't know where we're going, how are we going to get there? Come on, somebody. And the Bible says, and I saw, thank God for GPS. And I used to get lost sometimes. I was like a ball in tall weeds driving. Still, I still, I get lost with GPS sometimes. My wife says to me, now I gave you over the first 25 years of our marriage. Every time you went to South Bend, you wound up in Michigan. It's not that far from Knox, Indiana to Michigan. I live in West Lafayette now, so you can imagine. I end up in, now I end up in Illinois. She said, thank God for technology called GPS. Maybe he will listen to her since he has never listened to me. No. You know, guys, don't rub it in. I'm st the pit bull was bad enough. Oh, by the way, I'm not afraid of dogs anymore. Bring them on, walk, walk, all of them. Praise God in Jesus' name. Not afraid of them no more. I love dogs. They're wonderful. I always did. I just didn't, you know. Anyway, here's what it says. And I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. What? Not the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Not that white horse rider. Not the conqueror. Not the red horse of war. Not the black horse of the economy of collapsing. Not the pale horse of death. No, this is a different horse rider. This is the white horse and he that sat on him was faithful and true. His righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes are as a flame of fire. His head were many crowns. He has a name, a, a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. And the armies which were with him in heaven followed him him upon white horses clothed in the fine linen and white and clean can you say amen and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword and with it he should smite the nations and he should rule them with a rod of iron and he should tread at the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords folks the king is coming He's coming. 
He's coming. He's coming. Will you be ready when he comes? There's some that are here that may say, Pastor Paul, I'm tired of, I'm tired. My life's been, I've been up and down. I've been beat up. Let's get a, let's get a song. I've been beat up. I've been, I've been felt rejected. I feel alone. I've made mistakes, I'll be honest. I wonder sometimes if there really is a God. Does he really hear me? And I hope for hope. And I didn't even, I wasn't even gonna come here today. I don't know who you are. And people have been asking me to come to this church and I've been thinking about it. Oh, I've been here before. But you're trying to tell me that this is a big plan and that God cares enough for me that he would give his only begotten son. You're trying to tell me that if I'll believe in Jesus, that he can conquer the demons and the agony, and the pain in my life, in my heart. You're trying to tell me that the God you serve can cure diseases, can heal the sick. You're trying to tell me to put my whole faith and trust in this man named Jesus. I promise you something this morning. I promise you something this morning. When I was in a car accident 30 years ago, and the car rolled and I landed upside down in a ditch 20 foot deep and the car went underwater and I was in a seatbelt upside down. My life flashed before me. I see my wife and my children. And I first prayer I prayed quickly was, God, who will take care of my family? Then, then it came to me. I, was, I, I struggled with the seatbelt. It wouldn't unlatch. We're underwater. And the only thing I knew left to do was say, Jesus, help me. And the buckle went ting. I swam. <laughs> I swam to the floorboard where there was about that much air. I got just enough air. My head had hit the window and busted it out, so I swam out, I got some more air, and I went back in to get my buddy who was driving, who was still trapped. And I drug him out and got him out, and we climbed out of a ditch 20 foot deep and walked a half, hour, a half a mile to the nearest house. It was 12 degrees that morning. I was froze solid in mud and ice. I knocked on the door, the man got up, it was 4 a.m. And I said, can you call an ambulance? My buddy's hurt bad. He said, can I just use your phone to call my wife? He said, don't you want to go to the hospital? I said, no, I feel fine. He said, you sure? I said, yes. He said, why is your head sitting over here on your shoulder? I had a broken neck and didn't know it. Underwater, broken neck, in a seatbelt, going to die. But I called on the one name the one name, the only name, Jesus, Jesus help me. I'm gonna ask you to stand all over the building.